Yes. Okay. Yeah, let me see. Does it work? So I don't want to start with. I don't want to start So, um, can I have your can I have your attention, please? Uh, we, we're we're just waiting for a little technical um, machinery to come over here, which will hopefully get the spaceport started. But while we're waiting for that, um, my name is David Alexander. I'm the director of the Rice Space Institute, and um, I'm really honoured to have been asked to sort of MC tonight. Um, I've got three jobs. The first one is really easy, which is to welcome everyone. So welcome. Um, most of you are probably from the area and you know what we do here very well. Um, and so it's great to see you turn out and um, see this new development in the next phase of Houston's uh, making of history. I'd also like to welcome the Commercial Space Flight Federation who are hosting their, um, their members meeting, their semi-annual members meeting here over the next two days. Um, I'm sure they'll have a great couple of days and it'll be very productive. Um, I'd also like to thank um, the, all of you for showing up for this public uh, discussion on commercial space flight um, that's brought to you by the Houston Airport Systems, the Commercial Space Flight Federation, uh, the BAHEP, um, the Bay Area Houston Economic Partnership, and Barrios. Um, so thank you uh, for that sponsorship and, and uh, making tonight happen. Uh, the, before I, I, I go into uh, my first job, I've already done my first job, RICE has been connected with the space program here for, um, since its inception, really. So that's over 50, next week it'll be 51 years since President Kennedy gave his speech at the RICE Stadium. Um, there's a cutout of President Kennedy over there, and this gentleman with the beard behind here, don't look at him, but the thing he's standing behind is the actual podium that um, President Kennedy uh, stood behind uh, when he gave his speech at the, at the football stadium. It was a state-of-the-art podium with a push of a button that can rise and fall, and that was all wow then. Now we have laser pointers and things like that, so it's a little bit different. The second job I have tonight is to, in five, or in fact in less than five minutes now, um, is to extol the strengths and, and virtues of Houston and, and all the things we've accomplished here. This is something I could not possibly do in less than five hours, and if you were one of my students, you'd be groaning right now because I would start the five hours uh, right now. Um, so what I've tried to do, and I think I need my next slide, was, that's the technology. I've tried to encapsulate it. Um, Dan Seal and Bob Mitchell from, the, uh, from BAHEP typically, and many of us talk about the three-legged stool or the triumvirate of Houston, which is, of course, um, energy, space, and medicine. But really, when you start thinking about Houston, it's a little bit more, and with apologies to T.E. Lawrence, I've sort of brought it into the seven pillars. Um, we have a very... Um, large array of uh, universities in the area covering all sorts of areas from the engineering to the science to workforce development and so on, a very, very rich um, group of institutions nearby that factor into the space program and the high-tech industries that we have. And we have some very, very strong um, leadership both in, or in fact in, in academia, in industry and in government that help um, the business environment here and helped the space program and has helped the pro space program for the last 50 years. And all this is built on um, essentially pedestals of innovation, technology, and education. And I think these are the things that will, will make the spaceport thrive. It will make Houston the center that the, the, they are envisaging for the Houston spaceport. And if I can go to my next slide. This is how I sort of envisage it. This is all my own words. Don't blame Mario for any of these. But I see this as Basically, the, the, the thing I'm excited about the, um, the spaceport uh, and their, their vision for it 
is that it actually serves as a catalyst for all of the things we're already doing, but we're doing them in a sort of siloed way. We're sort of separate. We talk to each other a little bit. This is a way of bringing us all together to create this large-scale vision um, and bring the, the medicine together with um, the energy and the space sectors, a bit like pumps and pipes, but now we actually have a physical center where space is, is in the title, and I think that's really important. So the commercial utilization of space, of course, is a big growing area. We're going to hear more about that in a few minutes. Um, the partnership between and among all these institutions, the academia, the government, and the industry. Um, the international leadership in space. We already, everybody knows Houston. Um, this is the next stage, and we can keep that going. And the development of synergistic technologies, that sounds really fancy, but really what it means is that we, instead of working specifically for space, we can be solving space problems while solving medical problems, while solving energy problems. And we have the skill base and the technical base here in Houston to do that. And I think that's what I'm most excited about. And then space is also not about just going in and floating around and saying we. It's, it's about <laughs> what you need to do to put a human in space um, has a very, very many challenges. Many people in this room have solved a lot of those challenges or facing new ones. That's what we can bring to the terrestrial applications. As soon as there's a human involved, the technology becomes applicable on the ground. And that is where um, space becomes really important. And of course, the, the, the notion of the next 15, 20 years of whether we're flying in space planes from Houston to Singapore in half an hour. Um, I doubt Glasgow will have a, have a spaceport, but you never know. Um, that's, again, you're not looking just in the next few months or the next couple of years, but you're looking to the future. And I think the spaceport brings that to us. And so my last slide um, just makes a very obvious point. If we, the next slide. It's all about partnership and collaboration. And I think we do that um, really, really well in Houston. I think that's what we're known for. I think that's what we can build on. And so with that, my third job is to introduce the keynote speaker, the man behind the vision, along with some of his, his very capable staff, and that's Mario Diaz. So let me just read his bio because um, it's, he's an accomplished gentleman and I couldn't hope to remember all of this by myself. So Mario Diaz is director of the City of Houston Department of Aviation responsible for the overall management of IAH, Hobby Airport, and Ellington Airports. All complaints go to him. He's widely recognized as one of the industry's leading authorities in the study of future developments in commercial aviation. His career in transportation began with the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey in 1981, during which he also served for 18 months as the Assistant Director of Redevelopment Program at JFK. In 1999, he moved to Atlanta's Hartsfield Jackson International Airport as a Deputy General Manager, I think that's the busiest airport in the world, or at least it was, it may still be. Um, and then Mario arrived in Houston in, in 2010 and has had a number of notable successes um, that have led to an enhancement of the region's air transportation service. He was instrumental in the establishment of the International Flight Service from Hobby Airport, set for operations in 2015. He also welcomed the first Airbus 8380 aircraft to operate regularly, scheduled service in Texas, and played a key role in the arrival of international air carriers Turkish Airlines and Air China. He's a native of Barranquitas, Puerto Rico, and a licensed private pilot. He earned his Bachelor of Arts degree from Rutgers University and a Master of Business Administration and Finance from Rutgers Graduate School of Business Administration. Please join me in welcoming tonight's keynote speaker, Mario Diaz. Thank you, David, for that very warm introduction. And good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. I do have to take just a few moments to um, start off by saying thank you to and recognizing a few people. Uh, a big debt of gratitude goes out to Richard Allen, the president of Space Center Houston. Richard, thank you so much for providing us with this absolutely perfect venue um, in which to unveil our vision for what Houston's spaceport might look like. I also want to recognize uh, the following public officials and dignitaries who have been kind enough to join us today. Um, and, and please, if you would just uh, stand. David Sawyer, representing Senator Ted Cruz. Uh, we have uh, Holly Strong, representing Congressman Mike McCall. Uh, Bonnie Norman, representing Congressman Steve Stockman. Uh, Faye Picard, representing Representative Dr. Greg Bonner. John Davis, State Representative. Uh, Jack Christie, Council Member, City of Houston, 
uh, Diana Newland, council member, city of Webster, and former congressman Link, Nick Lampson. Nick, okay. Um, finally, I want to say thank you to Michael Lopez Alegria, um, the president of the Commercial Space Flight Federation, for choosing Houston as the as a site for their annual gathering. If you're not familiar with the Commercial Space Flight Federation, it's an organization made up of 40 companies that are directly involved in the commercial space flight industry <clears throat> um, that today these are the executives who are spearheading the major breakthroughs of commercial space flight, pushing the envelope in areas such as aircraft, spacecraft development, satellite deployment technology, research and development, and the transportation of cargo and crews to the International Space Station, and of course, in the future, space tourism. Members of the Commercial Space Flight Federation have been at the forefront of a host of major industry advancements, such as uh, SpaceX's involvement in the successful launch and docking of the Dragon space capsule, and Virgin Galactic and XCOR's drive to become the first companies in the nation to launch commercial passengers into orbital, suborbital um, space. The Commercial Space Flight Federation is committed to making commercial human sp space flight a reality. The Houston Airport System shares that vision and that goal, and we are thrilled that the leaders of the Commercial Space Flight Federation have chosen our city as the site for the latest round of exciting discussion on this topic. Just 13 years into the new century, and it is becoming more and more obvious with each passing month that this is the future of commercial passenger travel. The technology, the demand, the capital investment, it's all coming together in a way that paints a very clear picture for all of us to see. In the future, commercial spaceports will stand as the hubs of economic and cultural activity, just like the seaports and train stations did in the United States decades ago and airports do today. It's simply the latest step in the natural progression that we've been watching unfold for more than 200 years. If you look back over time at the major advancements of the 19th and 20th centuries, they all played an important role leading us to this point in time. Take, for example, the steam engine that powers the railroad industry, and America starts to look at something Thoreau called the tonic of wilderness. The combustible engine brings mechanized travel to the masses, and in 1903, Orville and Wilbur Wright changed the world forever by flying a total length of just 120 feet topping out at a maximum speed of 8.6 miles per hour. Since that time, we've seen the small steps and giant leaps come flooding into our lives at breakneck space. Science and engineering created amazing results throughout the first half of the 20th century, and by 1962, the new frontier wasn't driving east or west or north or south. It was challenging us to look up, to literally reach for the stars. That's when President John F. Kennedy spoke about the spirit of exploration. He challenged the country to put a man on the moon by the end of the decade, saying, we choose to go to the moon, not because it is easy, but because it is hard. I would imagine that just about everyone here knows where the president was standing when he spoke those words. It was at Rice University, just about 20 miles from the spot where we're standing here today. Earlier in the speech, the president said, Surely the opening vistas of space promise high costs and hardships, as well as high reward, so it is not surprising that some would have us stay where we are just a little bit longer to rest, to wait. But this is the city of Houston, this state of Texas, this country of the United States was not built for those who wanted to rest and wished to look behind them. This country was conquered by those who moved forward, and so will space. 50 years after that speech was given, those words have never carried more weight than they do today. We have been to the moon, we have conquered space, and the modern day commercial space flight industry is a $256 billion part of the global economy. So when we talk about the goals and plans associated with Houston Spaceport, it's important to remember that this is not a science fiction type conversation where we have to imagine how this industry might operate if it did in fact exist. This industry exists today these launches have already taken place. The Federal Aviation Administration already has an Office of Commercial Space Transportation, and part of its mission statement is to encourage, facilitate, promote U.S. commercial space transportation. 
there are already eight licensed commercial spaceports operating in the United States. Commercial payloads are already being launched into space. We are already seeing the merger of aviation and the aerospace industries taking place like never before. So there is a time coming not long from now when passengers will walk through facilities capable of handling both aircraft takeoffs and space launches. As you know, that's the stated goal of Richard Branson and his Virgin Galactic team. Just a few days ago, the Federal Aviation Administration officially accepted Branson's application for a license to operate their commercial space system in New Mexico, a facility that would operate with the carrier plane White Knight 2 and the space liner Spaceship 2. Both are still in the test phase in Mojave, <coughs> excuse me, but they eventually are slated to launch tourists. And Branson says that 2014 is a realistic goal in taking the first paying passengers into suborbit from a U.S. launch. And looking even further into the future, it's easy to envision other major steps forward in this industry. The creation of a modern day supersonic transport, major advances in areas such as geomapping, and even the 21st century FedEx business model taking supplies back and forth between Earth and outlying space stations. So again, the conversation taking place in Houston is not about whether commercial spaceflight industry will prosper. The question before us is how do we position Houston in a place to capitalize on this activity? Or to put it another way, what steps do we need to take to make sure that the place dubbed Space City USA in the 20th century lives up to that title in the 21st century? Now, I personally believe that one of the most important steps we could take is simply to highlight the attributes that the city of Houston already possesses, to make sure everyone understands and knows that we have all the tools necessary to establish Houston as the premier spaceport in the nation. We're perfectly situated geographically with close proximity to the Gulf of Mexico. We have the fastest growing economy in the United States. We have a highly motivated and educated workforce. We have a strong foundation of aerospace companies already operating in the area. And we have plenty of available land at the airport that already enjoys close connections with key agencies such as NASA, we have partnerships already in place with educational institutions like Rice University, Embry-Riddle Aeronautical, Texas Southern, and many others. And then, of course, there's the presence of the Johnson Space Center, one of the most storied and vital facilities in the aerospace industry today. In short, if you were to sit down at a drawing table and attempt to create the perfect location for a commercial spaceport, you would wind up drawing something very close to Ellington and the surrounding area. That's why we're so excited about the future of the Houston airport system, because the possibilities and the available resources are coming together in such a way that not even the sky is the limit anymore. We believe that the 20th century was about the development and the evolution of aviation, beginning in 1903 with the Wright brothers demonstrating heavier than air flight. The 21st century will be about the evolution and development of aerospace and the two are converging as we speak we've talked about it for many many years but we're at that cusp where we might be able to see commercial space become a reality houston is a great opportunity and great environment for that to happen not only are we located right near the johnson space center but ellington airport the possibility of ellington being an ellington spaceport what do you do with an airport like ellington that has a general aviation military history for all its years one of the oldest airports in, in the united states but is basically a general aviation military until you look past the boundaries of the airport and you notice that you have agencies like NASA and Johnson Space Center. And you have companies like Boeing and Lockheed Martin, you have Grumman, and you have a lot of other aviation or aerospace companies. And then you have the universities here. All these universities, each one of which has an aerospace component. And you look at Ellington, and only perhaps less than a third of it is actually occupied by general aviation and military. The rest is sitting there. And then the thought comes of the transition that is taking place in the United States from a federal space program to a commercial space program. We're in the infancy of a new industry. There was a report that valued the aerospace industry worldwide today at about 256 billion in 2010, and it's growing at about five to 8% compounded annually. Texas is open for business. 
not only is housing affordable, but industry here is very accommodating to new businesses. Unlike any place else in the country, this environment is gauged around how to make a company successful, whether it be aerospace, energy, IT, or uh, life sciences. It really doesn't matter. All those come together in Houston. All of manned flights, every one of them, has been managed, has been controlled, has been guided from Houston. And so Houston is a natural in terms of continued space exploration, space development. Imagine in 1903, the Wright brothers first taking off in this aircraft with a little putt-putt motor in it, and the century ending with an aircraft like the Airbus A380 that can carry over 565 people to just about any point on the world in absolute luxury. Imagine where we will be at the end of this century. Space is the new ocean for the world. And today, what man is doing is dipping its toe into the near space, starting to understand how to live in this new vast ocean. And we are just learning how to do that. And we'll see terminals, not like terminals we have today, with decompression chambers and all kinds of centrifuges to train astronauts and train people that will be going into space. And so all of this, all of it, can take place within the infrastructure, the buildings, whether they're high bay hangars or their logistics centers or research and development laboratories or centrifuges or just space, education space, office space, all of which can be built in Ellington in a setting, in an environment that is conducive to thinking so that in the future, just as people today, when they think about computer chips and they think about applications, think about Silicon Valley, in the future when these people think about space, they'll think about Houston. Tickets will be on sale, at the, at the, anyway. <clears throat> Thank you, thank you, Mario. I lied a little bit earlier. I've got a couple other little jobs to do. Um, one of the, the, the exciting parts of tonight's program, if this was not exciting enough, is our panel discussion. Um, before I go there, there's obviously there's an awful lot of astronauts in the room. Um, I'd like to sort of give a sort of special acknowledgement, acknowledgement to a friend of mine who's uh, sitting right there, is Dr. May Jemison, if you wouldn't mind standing, May. The space program. Oh. The space program looks very different today than it did a long time ago, um, and May was one of the sort of pioneers as the first African-American female astronaut from the United States, and so um, I'm glad you're here. It was a pleasant, pleasant to see you. <laughs> so tonight's panel has some uh, very accomplished and illustrious uh, folks on it. Um, I'm only going to introduce the moderator of one of them. Um, if I was to really read out his list of accomplishments, um, it would be quite long, and I've been told to not talk as much as I usually talk. So rather than try and read them very quickly, I basically cut most of them away. This man's got lots of medals and so forth, but I'm going to just give you some of the key things. Um, Michael Lopez Alegria is the, um, the host of tonight's panel. He is also the president of the Commercial Space Flight Federation, and his career has included positions as naval aviator, test pilot, and NASA astronaut. He's flown in three space shuttle missions and served as uh, International Space Station commander, holding NASA records for the longest space flight, which is 215 days, the most EVAs, which are spacewalks to you and me, and that's 10, and the cumulative EVA time of 67 hours and 40 minutes. Those mags must work really well. Um, so please join me in welcoming Michael Lopez Alegria. Thanks, Dr. Alexander. And uh, while I'm talking, if you guys could just take your seats. I know you're astronauts, but you ought to be able to figure out where to sit. <clears throat> so I'm super pleased to be here. Um, first of all, welcome to all the distinguished guests and um, to everybody else, too. And to those of you who are watching at home, we're actually streaming this on our uh, CSF website. Have a look. Um, this is pretty, it's going to be pretty fun. Um, an entertaining panel for you today. And um, 
Mario, that was a very um, nice introduction about the Commercial Space Flight Federation. I feel like I don't have much to say about it. Uh, we are, as he said, an industry association that represents about 40 companies all over the country uh, that are some way involved with commercial space. And uh, a lot of the bigger names are represented at this table up here, but there are some others, including many spaceports, some engineering services companies, um, some um, ancillary uh, suppliers, both big and small systems, et cetera. And we work and live in Washington, and our job is to influence public policy to make life better for those companies. And we do that because we really believe in, in this new changing of, um, or, or evolution in human spaceflight to what is going to be a very exciting time, both in the orbital and suborbital realms. And I'll let these fine gents talk about that in a minute. Um, as uh, Mario said, we are having our semi-annual meeting here in Houston, and we did that um, not least to show support for our, one of our new members, Houston Airport System, as they unveiled this uh, uh, great new initiative, which is very exciting, certainly. Uh, we also have several other companies that are based uh, or do a, a great deal of their operations here in Houston. And in fact, uh, over 30% of our members are based in Texas, so there's a natural nexus for us here. Um, but probably most importantly, um, you know, it's the tie to the legacy of human spaceflight that brings us here because that's what the CSF is all about. <clears throat> and as has been mentioned several times, uh, all of the flights with uh, Americans on board have been controlled um, by Johnson Space Center next door. And it's also the lead center for all of the flights of the International Space Station, which has been in orbit since 1998 and permanently inhabited since 2000. Um, a pretty impressive achievement. Houston is certainly synonymous with uh, space flight. And um, to give you an example, we don't have the Miami rockets, we have the Houston rockets. And you can come up with a baseball analogy on your own. Um, in any case, as important as that legacy is, I think this is an important step into sort of the next uh, era of, of uh, human spaceflight, which is commercial spaceflight. And what these um, five gentlemen in front of you, they have about three things in common that I can think of off the top of my head. One is that they can't afford a tie, apparently. <laughs> One is that they've all orbited the Earth uh, several times, done spacewalks, landed space shuttles, operated the robot arm, arms, and then amazing things. Um, and the third thing is that they left NASA to go pursue this dream of making human spaceflight um, a possibility, not just for, this, for them, but also for all of you in the suborbital world, and to become a, um, provide a service to NASA uh, so that we can get human uh, American astronauts going to the International Space Station built on American rockets um, that launch from American soil once again. So I'm gonna introduce each of them and ask them to come up here and um, give you a little bit about their company. And, um, and if there's time at the end, we'll take a few questions. So the first guy I'd like to uh, introduce is Chris Ferguson, call sign Fergie. I'll try to name all the call signs if I remember. You can ask him about that later. He's a captain in the United States, Navy retired. Uh, degrees from Drexel and Mechanical Engineering and uh, Naval Postgraduate School as a master's degree. After um, college, he went into the Navy, flew F-14s as a fighter pilot. He was a uh, Top Gun graduate. He's also been to test pilot school. Uh, he was hired by NASA in the class of 1998 as an astronaut. He flew twice as a pilot on space shuttles, uh, Atlantis on STS-115 and Endeavor on 126. I beg your pardon. STS-126 as Endeavor, he was a commander, as well as STS-135, which you may know is the last uh, space shuttle, and so he was the person who said definitively, we'll stop Houston. He's now the Director of Crew and Mission Operations for Boeing Space Exploration, having left the office in 2011. Please welcome Fergie. Thanks, Mike. I'm glad you don't have a tie on either. I was beginning to feel bad until I looked around your neck. Um, I checked my clip-ons when I left NASA, I guess. Um, so uh, Boeing, is no, uh, Boeing is no stranger to the airspace business. Of course, uh, Boeing is no stranger to the Houston area either. Uh, we've been firmly implanted uh, uh, either in the form of the space shuttle or the space station. 
Uh, in the local area, of course, uh, we're involved in the Space Launch System, which is uh, headquarters, at least from the Boeing standpoint, up in uh, Huntsville. And uh, not the least of which uh, is uh, finally the, uh, the commercial um, space program um, with our CST-100. So uh, I have been fortunate uh, to be a part of, of this program for about a year and a half right now. And uh, I stick to the adage, if you, if you can't fly them, you might as well build them. And uh, not a day goes by when, uh, when I don't uh, at least mention to one person that uh, I'm working really hard. I wish I had my old job back, but my old job doesn't exist anymore. So I'm here working with all of you to try to do, like Mike said, to get a, uh, an American back on an American vehicle uh, back in a low Earth orbit. Um, so let me just fill you in a little bit on where we are, uh, where we are with the CST-100. Um, and you can leave this chart up for just a moment because I, I want you to kind of have a flavor for the Atlas V. Okay, so the Atlas V is our launch vehicle. Uh, the Atlas V has 39 successful flights to its credit. I believe if I'm counting correctly, the last of which launched on July 19th. That was a Navy MUO satellite. It's got another one coming up here. It's uh, 40th uh, on, uh, in mid-August. So it's got a, a very successful, uh, I'm sorry, mid-September. It's got a very successful record um, of, uh, of launching vehicles successfully and safely into space, uh, not the least of which is uh, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, uh, the X-37, also a, a Boeing product. It's launched successfully a couple times. And uh, it works largely out of the Kennedy Space Center, but we also launch them uh, out in, uh, in California as well. Um, another integral part of our team, of course, uh, ULA is the prime contractor for the Atlas V launch vehicle. Another prime member of our team is the Mission Operations Directorate. Uh, again, right here in Houston, Texas, uh, we have basically contracted back uh, our Mission Operations Services uh, to the Mission Operations Directorate uh, right here. Um, so what that brings to the table is, uh, is worlds and uh, at least 50 years worth of experience in human spaceflight. Uh, it is a pleasure to work day in and day out with the likes of uh, Kelly Beck, uh, Richard Jones, Bob Dempsey, all uh, heroes of mine. Um, I put my life in their hands uh, when uh, they, were, uh, they were operating the, shuttle that we, the shuttles that we were operating. And uh, it is, uh, it's great to have them as a part of the Boeing team right now. So, uh, you know, I tell them often, I said, you are uh, such an integral part of our team when America tunes in, hopefully, a few years down the road and, uh, and watches the next American launch on an Atlas V vehicle out of the east coast of Florida. They're actually going to watch the Johnson, uh, Johnson Space Center's Mission Control Center and, uh, and our MOD team uh, with a few uh, select Boeing representatives uh, there working for us and with us. And they've been there with us uh, all the way for about the last year or so, and we, uh, we hope to have them and we continue to have them as a part of our team until we're ready to fly. Uh, other integral members, um, uh, we have, uh, or actually let me just tell you a little about our, about our mission before I go to the charts. Um, we, uh, we're an autonomous vehicle, so we intend to launch and autonomously uh, operate until we dock with the space station. That doesn't uh, preclude our ability to fly manually if we need to. Uh, and one of the biggest challenges that I found is operating a vehicle uh, that is largely designed to operate by itself, but yet provide that a capability for the crew to take over and, and execute uh, critical actions uh, uh, manually if need be. Uh, specifically, our, one of our requirements is to dock manually if we have to. So again, it's that, uh, that delicate balance between autonomy and human in the loop has proven to be one of our challenges, but one we really enjoy. Um, if we have to, we could abort to the water. We have a pusher abort system that will push us off the top of the rocket. The nice thing about a pusher system is the propellant that we would otherwise, or that former uh, capsules had used uh, to, uh, to abort with, that we threw away halfway through the trajectory, we are, we're allowed to keep now. And the, the, the propellant we don't use to push ourselves away in the event of abort would be used for orbital maneuvering. So it's a real advantage. Uh, we intend to land on land. Um, I'll have a picture of one of our future runways uh, here uh, shortly, and you'll get an idea of what it's like to land on land. Most vehicles uh, that have operated uh, with humans on board have even chosen the water or, uh, or a runway. So this is, uh, we're gonna choose neither, and uh, we'll give you an idea of where we intend to go. Um, some of our recent milestones, uh, we have certification plan is uh, currently at work right now. That's a real big deal to those who, uh, who keep track of such things, namely our NASA customer. Uh, we've recently conducted an interface demonstration test. Uh, that's a test to ensure that our simulator, uh, which is located in a Boeing facility not far from here, next to the Neutral Buoyancy Lab, can communicate with the Mission Control Center. Uh, we've had a, a dual-engine Centaur. Okay, the Centaur is the uh, Atlas V's upper stage. Hasn't flown in a dual-engine configuration in an awful long time, so uh, we're recertifying the dual-engine Centaur for our vehicle. We recently had a successful development test. 
and uh, we had a preliminary design review for our emergency escape system. Uh, of course, Launch Pad 41 at the Cape will be uh, our launch facility, which is uh, currently launches unmanned rockets. We're going to have to build a, a crew access tower and a crew access arm attached to that tower, and we're going to build an emergency egress system that we just had a successful preliminary design re uh, review on. Uh, why don't you go ahead and go to the first chart? You know, uh, for those of you who are in Houston, um, you may have uh, had an opportunity. We had a, a kind of an open house media day about uh, about a month ago, and uh, I'll tell you, we just kind of sent out a, a, a blanket invitation to the press to come and take a look because uh, we've had, you know, as I'm sure a lot of the partners have, a lot of attention to uh, to our program, and uh, it was uh, I was overwhelmed by the response to the tune that the the next day. Uh, a picture similar to this ended up in the Chronicle on the front page above the crease, and that was about the last thing I was expecting, so it was a very welcome surprise. But I think it's an indication of how curious America is and how hungry they are to know where America stands, and uh, I think they were very welcomed by the news uh, and uh, very interested in what we have planned. Um, what we've done in this mock-up, and why don't you go to the next chart? Uh, we've uh, invited NASA. To, we're very proud of our relationship, and, and I think it's largely driven by our proximity to the Space Center. Uh, we've invited a lot of the NASA crew members to come over and take a look at our vehicle. Uh, we've done suited, uh, pressurized uh, ingress and egress tests. Uh, we've had them give some comments on the reach and visibility of our switches, and I think it's worked out very well. We have a very symbiotic relationship, and it's great to have them on board with us. Um, next chart. Um, you know, Pressure suits were not originally a requirement for this program, but uh, they did come in recently, and I think all the competitors right now are, are uh, not struggling, but we're cooperating with a lot of the potential suit vendors to go out there and, uh, and uh, find a, a suit that uh, looks good, works well, and uh, is uh, pleasing to the customer. So we had a couple candidates come in and give us a test. You can actually see what our hand controller looks like right there. Of course, that's a mock-up, but uh, you know it's very important, I think, to get the crews uh, in paint and make sure they enjoy the vehicle and that, uh, that it's, uh, it's suitable for their purposes. Um, next chart. Um, as I mentioned, we intend to land on land. Uh, so uh, how are we going to do this? Uh, some of you may recall Orion, as originally conceived, was going to be a, a land lander as well. And it, uh, it was going to land on airbags uh, on, a, on a flat lake bed. Um, Orion has since, I think, uh, gone to a water type landing. But we've used a lot of that technology to, uh, to, use, uh, to land our vehicle on any one of uh, five different landing sites we picked uh, out in the western United States. We'll show you a candidate coming up here shortly. Um, it's been a real, uh, it's been a, a, a in, very interesting program to work with and watch our team uh, work hand in hand with Bigelow Aerospace to, to drop our vehicle not only on land surfaces and test the, uh, the crosswind capability that we have, but also to land in water because we can land in this configuration of the water as well. Uh, next chart. I mentioned landing sites. You know, it doesn't look like Houston, but, uh, but this is part of our landing site development. You know, it's very interesting uh, as part of the mission operations organization to go around and, and solicit various organizations. You know, we're, we need about, uh, oh, about a 10 kilometer radius uh, area of uh, air, uh, land that's essentially flat and, and barren of most things. We can handle small uh, twigs and trees, but we don't want anything large. So when you go to organizations that own these types of things, you, you explain to them that you know, you're, you're part of America's effort to get back to the International Space Station, and you tell them that you want to land your spaceship in their backyard. And after they get through the chuckles, uh, they realize, hey, this would be a really cool thing to be a part of the, the space program. So, uh, but you also realize it's very hard to find flat, 10 flat kilometers of, of area out there in the western United States. And this is one of our candidates not too far from Yuma. Um, next chart. So ultimately, what do we have in mind? We have the customer. Um, you know, the customer's NASA, and this is the destination. Uh, for those of you who I've told this story to already, I apologize, but uh, uh, shortly before we launched on SCS-135, Jerry Ross, um, who many of you know, um, put a, uh, an envelope in my pocket. He said, uh, hey, I'll tell, me, tell you a story about this. This was an American flag flew on STS-1. Uh, your directions by the president are to leave this flag on the International Space Station. And uh, the story behind it is that it's to return back uh, with the company that manages to take an American up to the space station next uh, at the start of uh, commercial services. So that flag is up there, and it's waiting uh, for either one of us to go and get it. And I say to the victor, go the spoils, uh, but uh, we plan to be next. So thank you very much. Thank you, Fergie. Next up is uh, Jim Voss. Call sign Dogface. I'm not making this up. Colonel, United States Army, retired. 
Uh, graduated from Auburn with a Bachelor of Science in Aero and uh, Master of Science also in Aero from the University of Colorado. He um, was an infantry officer in the Army, and I guess they say that in the Army there are two types of service, infantrymen and everybody else who supports them. He also a graduate of Air Airborne and Ranger School. He taught at West Point for a while. He went to the United States Naval Test Pilot School as a flight test engineer, and he's also a private pilot, hired by NASA in the class of 1987. Uh, he's flown only four space shuttle missions and one long duration mission aboard the ISS on which he flew to and from another space shuttle mission. So that's six by my count. During that time he did uh, four spacewalks. He spent five and a half months in space on that one uh, increment. Uh, he left NASA in 2003 to return to Auburn and then in 2007 he joined a company called Space Dev which uh, later became part of the Sierra Nevada Corporation which led to his uh, most recent job, which is former, or he is now an advisor and the former vice president of, for, of space exploration for the Sierra Nevada Corporation. Jim Voss. Well, good evening. Pleasure to be here. Uh, you know, I, I was really, really pleased to see, Mr. Diaz, that on your uh, Houston spaceport symbol that you had a vehicle with wings. That's really good and near and dear to my heart. Being the only company that's building a vehicle with wings, uh, you know, I'm particularly proud. I, I put up there an American human spacecraft. Uh, we don't have the capability today to launch humans into space from our nation. That bothers me as an American. We have Americans in space. They're living and working on the International Space Station, but we depend on another nation to get us up there right now. Uh, the companies that are represented here and, and probably some others are making an attempt to develop commercial spacecraft that will be able to take Americans back to space again. Now, the Orion spacecraft is a wonderful spacecraft, and it's being built uh, by our nation's space program and Lockheed Martin Corporation and a bunch of other supporting companies, and they are going to build a wonderful spacecraft, and it's going to do a, a, a great mission. It's going to go out and help us to explore our solar system, but it's going to be very capable, more capable than you need to take people to the uh, space station and back. We hope that the commercial companies who are moving very quickly and uh, will be able to launch humans and put them on the space station within just a few years. The Dream Chaser, uh, I want to tell you just a little bit about it, background information, because everybody doesn't know about us. Most people think that Sierra Nevada is the beer company. <laughs> I wish. Uh, it's not, but uh, next slide, please. Uh, it will be, we think, our next human piloted vehicle. Many of the things that Fergie said are true about our vehicle, except for a couple of small points. One, we have wings, and the other is that we're piloted. Maybe I'm prejudiced because I grew up and spent all of my space career in the space shuttle program, but I really believe that human beings have a lot to add when you're flying a vehicle, and that includes spacecraft. I watched a lot of commanders fly and dock to the International Space Station. I watched them land the space shuttle, and I will always believe that the human adds something, an added factor of safety that makes the vehicle perform better and that allows us to do more. Doesn't mean I don't believe in automation because our spacecraft is also automated. Should there be a problem like a completely deconditioned crew coming back from the International Space Station after many months of being up there and not physically capable of flying very well? They'll think they can, but they probably won't be able to. Uh, so we want to have a fully automated capability with the vehicle as well. So on return, it's fully automated. Going up, it's piloted. It can be automated except for the docking, which we want humans to do. Next slide, please. It has a great background in history. In the 60s and 70s, we were doing lifting body research out at the Dryden Flight Research Center. Uh, those of you that are old enough to remember this uh, $6 million man, that vehicle that rolled up on the runway was one of these type. Uh, the Russians, we think, picked up on some of the ideas of lifting bodies, uh, small winged vehicles, and they built something called the Bohr 4. They flew it in orbit a few times. They returned it to the Earth. They were doing testing with it, uh, and it had some really uh, unique characteristics that when we heard about it, we thought we should probably study that. It was turned over to the Langley Research Center to study and to uh, reverse engineer and see what the Russians were up to. Uh, next slide, please. And what they came up with was a design that they then tested extensively with wind tunnel testing, analysis, uh, piloted simulations, and it was called the HL-20, Horizontal Lander 20, and that is the basis for the Dream Chaser. Uh, 
Uh, the Sierra Nevada Corporation uh, took the, all the work that was done by NASA and NASA Langley, and they have brought that forward and modernized it, added more modern materials that have been used on the space shuttle, the space station, a lot of the systems that are very similar to those that have been used before, and all the experience and things that we learned from the space shuttle program, and have tried to incorporate those into a smaller crew-specific uh, vehicle, the Dream Chaser. Next slide. The concept is it launches on an Atlas V, I'll say more about that in a minute, goes to the space station, can stay there 210 days uh, to support a crew while they're up there. Uh, they're available for an emergency return at any time. And what's really great about having a wing vehicle, I really mean any time. You can depart at any time and have enough cross range, the ability to fly away from your, your ground track that you start out on and land on a runway. Uh, that's a real good feature of having a lifting body. It's a real gentle return. It's similar to the space shuttle, about one and a half times the normal acceleration due to gravity. So it's, it's fairly gentle. It's, uh, I mean, I, I won't talk bad about my, my friends and competitors, but it's easier to come back in a lifting uh, vehicle than it is in a capsule, easier on the crew. Lands on a runway. Uh, that's an advantage, too. There are a lot of places in the world that have runways plenty long enough to land. I, we, our minimum is about 7,000 feet, and we've specified about 10,000. Many, many runways that can be landed on uh, with the spacecraft. Intending to fly back to the Kennedy Space Center and land and process there uh, and to be controlled here out of Houston. It's very, very similar to the space shuttle. Next. That's what it looks like compared with the shuttle. It's a lot smaller, but it is 30 feet long, 25 feet wide. It holds seven people and has almost the same amount of room as the space shuttle had inside for the crew. What we don't have is the really big payload bay in the back to carry very large things. The shuttle carried people very well, but it carried really big cargo as well. It was a truck and it, it, would, it would carry a lot to space. We can carry just a little bit of cargo inside, but our purpose is to carry human beings, Americans, to the International Space Station. Next. We do launch on the Atlas V, just like uh, Boeing is planning to do with the CST-100. That's good. It's a common launch vehicle. Uh, Fergie had it right. I'm one behind on the launches. It is 139 and, and 39 of the Atlas V category, which is slightly different, but they've all been completely successful. It's a very reliable rocket, and that's what we like about it and why we selected it as the vehicle to be used to carry humans. Uh, we can abort off of it the same way as, as uh, Fergie's. Our rockets are in the back, and they're used to help get us into orbit, but also to conduct the borts. This is one of those motors that we use. It's a proprietary technology from Sierra Nevada Corporation. We built the rocket motors that Spaceship One used to win the X Prize, and the, we're building the rocket motors for Spaceship Two for the suborbital flights that they're going to do. It's different. It's a hybrid rocket motor. It, it's not solid and it's not liquid. It's a combination of the two. It uses rubber, like tires. It's the same kind of stuff, synthetic rubber. And it uses laughing gas, uh, nitrous oxide, same thing you use in the dentist office. So the propellants are very safe, and that's one of the reasons we've chosen them. They're not as good as some other propellants. They don't produce as much thrust or as performance, but they're really, really, really safe. And the Atlas is so good, we don't need the additional thrust and so this winds up being a very, very good solution for human vehicles. Uh, this was a test that we completed out in our California near San Diego facility where we do rocket motor testing. Next, please. We plan to uh, dock to the International Space Station using the NASA docking system or International Docking System. Next. We'll stay there for our, however long NASA needs us to, and then we'll return, very much like the space shuttle. It uses the thermal protection system materials that are very similar to what was used on the space shuttle with some modern technology, uh, things that were even, uh, th that have been used on the X-37, the Boeing vehicle that has lifting body vehicle that's flown in space recently. So we're upgrading using more modernized materials that were used on the space shuttle. Next. We land on a runway, piloted, uh, two pilots on board, and we, we uh, will land at the Kennedy Space Center or someplace similar. Next. We can hop right out. Uh, space shuttle, you had to wait a while. They had to make sure it was safe, uh, that the hazardous gases were dispersed or not around the spacecraft. Now, since we don't have any hazardous chemicals on board, we can open the hatch and just hop right out uh, right away and look around and look cool in the suits after you return. Next. Uh, real quick thing about what we're doing right now. 
Now, we really believe in hardware testing. I, I was a test guy. I like tests. I like to build things and then test them. Uh, we're very focused on testing hardware. We've done hundreds of tests over the last year. Many of the systems, the components, the things that we built the vehicle with have been going through tests, and we're, we've just culminated that with building an entire flight test vehicle that we're getting ready to fly right now. Next slide. Uh, that's a picture of it out at the Dryden Flight Research Center where everybody should do their flight testing. And it's next to the M2 F1, which was the first lifting body that our nation ever flew. Uh, that thing was towed behind a Pontiac Catalina to get it into uh, flying. And then they towed it behind a, a Goonie Bird, a C-47. And they flew it up and they, they did gliding flights back in it. The space shuttle, you may remember, did approach and landing test, ALT testing, by flying on top of a 747. They released it and it flew back and uh, you, they got the important information they needed for the final part of the approach and landing. Uh, we're going to do the same thing with the Dream Chaser. It's just recently done what we call a captive carry test. We're carrying it up under a helicopter. It's a little easier than towing that we may tow later on, and it's a little easier than putting on a, the top of an airplane. We tow it up with a, underneath the helicopter, and we did a test just a couple of weeks ago where we took it up, flew it, checked all the systems to make sure it's working, and the next thing we're going to do is release it and allow it to fly back and land on a runway autonomously this time, and then eventually a year or so from now we'll do piloted approach and landing tests with it. So I wanted to show you a quick video of that uh, test last week in anticipation of, in about a, a month or so, the actual drop test that will fly back autonomously. So next. Oh, that's a picture of it doing uh, one of the early lift tests that we did out in Colorado. Next. This is actually a NASA video. Uh, they're very quick with getting their videos produced. So I borrowed it. <clears throat> you have to do flight tests really early in the morning. If you're a test pilot or flight test engineer, you get used to seeing the sunrise when it's calm and quiet, and you can get out and do your test flying. An H-54 helicopter, you might see them doing things like firefighting and other things like that. It has a lot of capability. It lifts a lot. So it can lift our little spacecraft, take it up to about 12,000 feet or so where it will drop it. The big pointy thing on the front end is a test boom for getting the air data that we need when we fly it. A little parachute behind it is to keep the pointy end pointed forward so that when we release it, it's headed in the right direction. That's what it looks like flying out over the lake beds out in Edwards Air Force Base Dryden Flight Research Center. Dryden is a partner of ours. They're helping us. Uh, they're one of our teammates. We pay them to, to do work and do the kind of work that only they can do in flight tests. We were testing all the systems, including the landing gear deployment and all the other things that must work uh, when we actually drop it and fly it back to the runway. So as they were coming back in, they were testing all the avionics and ensuring that things were doing what they were supposed to do. And we had uh, what I hope will be the worst landing that we'll ever have. And that's the Dream Chaser. Thank you, Jim. Okay, next up is Garrett Reisman. I don't know which call sign to use. He likes Big G. We have some others for him. <laughs> he's interested, interesting in that um, of all the people at the table, he's the only one that doesn't have um, some rank, some service retired. In other words, he was not a military officer before. He has different letters after his name, PhD. So. He uh, started out with a sort of a dual degree in economics and mechanical engineering from Penn, and then a master's and PhD in mechanical engineering from Caltech, so clearly not an academic slouch. Uh, after that, he did two years as a GNC, a guidance navigation control engineer at TRW, and then was hired by NASA in the class of 1998. He was, uh, his first flight was part of Expedition 16 on the International Space Station, and then he flew STS-132, which was a, uh, an assembly, ISS assembly mission, where he did two more of his three spacewalks and also operated the uh, robotic arm. Uh, he left in 2011 to join SpaceX, where he's now the commercial crew project lead. And the other distinction that he has that none of us at the table have, nor anybody else in this country, 
is that he survived a horrible failure on orbit, which was a catastrophic loss of the space potty. <laughs> Pooh Bear. Huh. <laughs> I want to point out that why I, uh, while I wasn't part of the military, I was in the Weeblos. <laughs> Actually, more to the point, I failed out of the Weeblos. I, there was too much pressure to get those merit badges, and I couldn't hack it. <laughs> so I never made it to Boy Scouts. Um, I was on the International Space Station, though, on Expedition 16. My commander at, uh, was Peggy Whitson, who's here today somewhere. Peggy? Yay. And she's still talking to me, which is awesome. <laughs> um, we, I was up there with, uh, uh, for 95 days, which actually was kind of a bummer. Um, because if you stay up for 100 days, you get a patch. Thank you. <laughs> but I left NASA, um, uh, boy, I guess it was about two and a half years ago. And uh, came out to California, and there I, I have been working there ever since at SpaceX. And uh, SpaceX was founded, if we can go to the next slide, about 11 years ago to further the cause of human spaceflight. That's the whole purpose for the company, not necessarily to maximize ROI or achieve some financial objective, but that's really why we exist. And we've grown a lot in the past 11 years. We're up now to over 3,500 employees. We have over a half a million square feet in our largest facility, which is in the middle picture there, down in Hawthorne. I suggest you come visit sometime. It's, it's a pretty awesome facility. One, one, one of the things that's so awesome about it is how much we have under one roof. So it's our factory. That's where we manufacture the rockets. It's also our headquarters and engineering, our technical center. All the engineers that design the rockets sit in the front of that building. It's our operations center. Our mission control is inside that building. And it's a, a, a large part of our test facility as well, at least all of our non-reactive testing, because they don't like when you light up rockets and make a lot of fire and smoke in Los Angeles. So instead, we do that here in Texas. <laughs> <laughs> and we have um, a site. It's over 600 acres up in central Texas near Waco, where we do all of our reactive testing. You see a picture up there of uh, the Falcon 9, our rocket on the tripod doing a stage test. And that wasn't just a one-off trying to test the stage. One of the things that we're really big about is testing what we fly as we fly. Every single Falcon 9 we launch, we first send to Texas and light all nine engines uh, as a stage. And we will continue to do that as we go forward. Uh, then we have launch pads at the Cape, where our missions to the ISS have uh, been based out of. And we have our new launch pad at Vandenberg. Our very next launch, uh, we're, we're, we, we are a company that doesn't think small, and I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment. But our very next launch is uh, basically a brand new rocket, the Falcon 9 1.1, which is the upgraded rocket that meets all the human rating cap standards that you need to fly people, including things like uh, triplicate uh, avionics, factors of safety structurally of 1.4, all those things that you need uh, to be human rated are in that rocket. And uh, it's also our first flight of this new launch pad at Vandenberg. And it's also the first flight that will have a fairing, which is a tricky thing that you have to deploy when you launch satellites. So it's kind of like just rip that band-aid band right off. We're going to do it all at once on, 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 on uh, the very first try. And that's, we're only about a week away from that launch, so keep your eyes peeled. Um, we have, uh, I mentioned our pad at Cape Canaveral. We're also looking for a commercial pad. And, and as many of you know, Texas is uh, definitely in the forefront uh, down at Brownsville is where we uh, think is probably the most likely place for that launch pad, our third launch pad. Okay, so what I'd like to talk about is, is like I said, we don't, my boss, Elon Musk, he, he doesn't think small, whether it be about transportation from Los Angeles to San Francisco or really anything. So one of the things that we're trying to do is not make an incremental step forward in human spaceflight, but make a revolutionary step forward in human spaceflight. So we've already reduced the cost of launching to low Earth orbit by just one order of magnitude. And we are, tr but that's not good enough. We want to reduce it by several orders of magnitude, the cost of taking a pound to orbit. Now to do that, you need to accomplish affordable reusability. If you think about it, if you took a 747 from Houston to 
um, say, London. And when you got there, you took that 747 and you threw it away and had to build a new one to come home. Not many of us would be able to afford flying around commercially on airliners, but we don't do that. Another uh, metric is uh, the uh, commercial airliner, the cost of the fuel represents over 70% of the cost of the flight from point A to point B. For a rocket, boy, it's like 1% or 2% of the cost of the flight. So it gives you an idea of how much room there is for improvement in the economics of space travel. And so what we're trying to do is, again, hit that affordable reusability. The first thing we're going to try to do is reuse our first stage. And that's why we've been working on the grasshopper. So we show the grasshopper video, please. The idea is we launched a rocket, and then after, the sec after staging, you keep a little gas in the tank. And you use that gas, as you see grasshopper take off. This, also, this is our facility in Texas, by the way. You use that gas in the tank to boost back, return to launch site, and land vertically just like Buck Rogers. And then the idea is you, all you need to do is a walk around, put gas back in the, in the vehicle, and you're, you're ready to launch again the next day. That's the type of operations tempo we're working on. This test is a divert test. This is the first time we sent it up 250 meters, but we sent it 100 meters laterally to see if it's, off, if it's off course, could it correct? Could it find its way back to the launch site? There it is steering back, which is pretty awesome watching this massive rocket uh, kind of turn on a dime. And now it's coming down. The other unique thing about it is one Merlin engine, which normally produces 147,000 pounds of thrust, throttled back to 70% still gives you more thrust than the rocket will weigh. So what's happening here is it's decelerating continuously all the way down to touchdown. There's no hovering, holding, and then slowly setting down. It's got to be done just right. And there she did. She went up 250 meters, 100 to the side, decelerated, decelerated all the way to touchdown. And that was the, la the latest flight of Grasshopper. And we got bigger and better things planned for, for her. But this is all about achieving the real economic breakthrough in space flight. If we go to the next slide, please. But what I'm really uh, most excited about in my job, I, it, I hope so because it's my job, is working on uh, crew transport at SpaceX. So like uh, Fergie and Jim, we're working with uh, NASA in partnership in a commercial crew program to, uh, to, to work on finding a way to get Americans back into space. So we've been working on this for a couple years now. We, we have our Falcon 9 rocket, the Dragon spacecraft, the same spacecraft that has already been successful numerous times taking cargo up to the space station. We're, we're, we're starting with that and figuring out what do we do, need to do to modify that to carry people. Next slide. So we started working for a while on this. You see we figured out the layout of the interior. We have two rows, so it's kind of stadium seating. The upper row is first class. Costs a little, <laughs> no baggage fees in, the upper, in that row, but you do have to pay extra in the, in the bottom row. Uh, but we do plan to carry seven people. You see we've been developing also, like Fergie mentioned, a pusher abort system for the same uh, av advantageous reasons that, that Fergie pointed out. And that's it firing up at our facility in, in Texas in the upper right. We've got the upgraded Merlin uh, 1D engine, which is a step forward in reliability. And you see that test firing down here in the lower left. And we're working on crew displays and entry modeling for the new outer mold line. Next slide. So what we have coming up, uh, uh, Jim mentioned hardware and testing, and that's really big for us. We are going to do two big hardware tests over the, next, over the course of the next year. And that is we're going to test our, our capability to do a pad abort and a launch abort. And we're going to do this uh, with a test article that's incredibly flight-like, more flight-like than any pad abort or, or any abort test vehicle uh, to date. Usually you just basically take a hunk of metal that looks like a capsule and you're testing out the rocket that carries it away. But we're do the, the primary structure is going to be exactly the same as the primary structure on our flight vehicle. The avionics are going to be exactly the same. The entire propulsion system uh, for the abort is exactly the same. So the level of fidelity is going to be extremely high, and we've already started building it. The weldment is complete for the pad abort test article. Uh, so the primary structure is all done. We're starting to work on secondary structure and the propulsion components and the avionics, and we're qualifying all, those, all that equipment for this test. So we're, we're making great progress, and early in 2014, we're going to go down to the Cape and do this pad abort, which tests out um, your, your total impulse. In other words, you have enough gas in your tank to get high enough and far enough away from the fireball uh, that you're trying to escape from to get the parachutes out and safely come down in the water. The next big test, we're going to go up to the point of maximum aerodynamic drag. We're going to take our uh, honest-to-goodness Falcon 9, 
stick the dragon on top of it, launch the Falcon 9, and at the point where it's the hardest, we're going to have the dragon fly away to safety, uh, even though it should be a perfectly good Falcon 9 at the time. So that's what we have coming up. It's big, exciting stuff, and um, it's getting us very close to getting ready to strap people into the dragon. Uh, next slide. So uh, several of the other guys have touched upon this, but I really want to drive this home. You know, for over two years now, uh, since Fergie called Will Stop on Atlantis, the United States of America does not have the capability to send people into space. And as these guys already mentioned that they're not happy about it, I'm certainly not happy about that. I don't think anybody in this room is, is happy about that. And meanwhile, we're spending about a half a billion dollars a year, okay, a, this more money than we're spending on the commercial crew program, we're sending to Russia to buy Soyuz flights to get our guys and girls up to, to the space station. I don't think that's right. And uh, we're going to fix that in the very near future. We've already got cargo going up to the space station on American rockets, but soon our astronauts are going to be going back up to the space station on American rockets. Thank you very much. So a little programming note, um, Garrett may have to, have to step away here in about five minutes or so. It's not that he doesn't like to hear the next speaker talk. Um, and I also want to give a little context. So the first three speakers were all um, participants in this commercial crew program, which is, as you heard now, NASA's attempt to uh, have a organic U.S. capability to launch our astronauts to the ISS. A lot of the excitement around commercial spaceflight is also about the suborbital world, and so I'm going to transition now into talking a little bit more about that. And the next company, uh, Blue Origin, while still a participant in the commercial crew program under a non-funded Space Act agreement, is also has a foot in the uh, suborbital uh, camp as well. So let me uh, talk about the next speaker, who is Jeff Ashby, call sign Bones, Captain, United States Navy, retired. Uh, mechanical engineering degree from the University of Idaho and a master's in aviation systems from the University of Tennessee. Uh, he was unusual in that he went, he did a, pretty much a full military career before he came here. So all the way through as a um, uh, F-18 fighter attack pilot, including going to Top Gun and also being a squadron commander. And then he came to NASA, which is pretty unusual. He also went through um, test pilot school. He had 65 combat missions in Operation Desert Storm and Southern Watch. Hired in 1995 uh, as an astronaut, flew on STS-93 Columbia and on STS-100 Endeavor, both as a pilot, and then commanded STS-112 aboard Atlantis. He left NASA in 2008, now the Chief of Mission Ass Assurance at Blue Origin. Bones. Thank you. Uh, call sign Bones, that's the first call sign I didn't like, so it stuck. <laughs> that's the way it works sometimes. Um, I want to talk to you tonight about the great little company that I work for called Blue Origin. If you're like most people, you either know very little about Blue Origin, or you know quite a bit, a portion of which is misinformation. So um, I'm going to try and clear that up tonight. Um, some of you in the audience also are from NASA. You've worked with us. You know us very well. You know us to be a small, professional, disciplined company with uh, uh, strong tenacity and a, uh, a drive to succeed in this business. Next slide, please. Next, please. All right. Um, some facts about Blue Origin. We have a long-term vision of increasing the number of people that fly into space. We believe that's the right thing for our country and the world. We were founded um, 13 years ago now by Jeff Bezos, who uh, many of you have heard of. Uh, also founded, very successfully ran Amazon.com. Jeff is a uh, very passionate guy about space. He grew up with um, many of the same dreams that we did, and uh, he founded this company to try and make a difference. Uh, we are focused on developing vehicles and technologies uh, that will make space launch for humans more affordable and more safe, both of which should enable a greater human presence in, in Earth orbit. We have two facilities, two primary facilities. The top one that you see there is our office and manufacturing facility in Kent, Washington. 
Unlike Los Angeles, we're able to have an engine test stand in, in the backyard, um, which has been a real big advantage for us. We also have a facility down in West Texas, and Fergie showed you a picture of uh, uh, the flat um, eastern or western Texas desert uh, looking for 10 kilometers. We have that out in West Texas in the only private uh, launch facility. This is a suborbital sub launch facility. It's also a place that we're able to build very big engine test stands that wouldn't be allowed in Kent or LA. And so we have a, um, quite a facility out there in West Texas and we're very proud to be uh, uh, working and flying out of Texas. This is for suborbital launches, which is essentially straight up and straight down. Um, in the profile that we fly, about a 12 minute ride, two minutes up, four minutes of coast, and about another four or five minutes uh, descending under parachute. We are um, also an, an orbital company. We have our sights on orbital flight, which takes uh, about 10 times the energy to get orbital speed. And really in order to do that safely, you have to launch from somewhere near a coast. So we're actively seeking an orbital launch site on the coasts in the US. Next slide, please. Uh, it's been pointed out by many of my colleagues very correctly that the way you get the cost down for these systems is you stop throwing your rocket in the ocean uh, every time you use it. Um, reusability is really the way to get affordability, and it actually adds to safety as well because you can bring your equipment back and inspect it, fly it many times, and refine it. We have, as I said, uh, we're focused on both suborbital and orbital. Um, in the suborbital regime, you can see that uh, second to last picture there, the small little uh, pill-shaped rocket. It's actually about 60 feet tall. Uh, that's our suborbital system, which we have called New Shepard. It consists of two elements, a uh, crew capsule that's composite. Turns out that composite materials are very good for the suborbital mission and the temperatures that we expect on that. And we have a propulsion module that uh, very uniquely in the suborbital realm lands by powered vertical flight much like you saw in uh, Garrett's video of their first stage. That technology, powered vertical flight, extends to orbital flight as well. As SpaceX is doing, we are as well, intending to recover our first stage vertically with the, uh, with the engines. Um, the first two pictures you see here also are, um, I'm going to show videos of those, but they are evidence that we are flying full-scale hardware out of our facility in Texas. Um, we are real. Uh, we've been in flight tests for quite a few years, and um, we're pretty excited about our suborbital capability coming online soon. Um, in the orbital realm, uh, orbit requires uh, much more propulsion, much higher energy to get the orbital speed, and you see that rocket on the far right there. Consists of a first stage that would be reusable, again, recovered, powered vertical flight, and probably an expendable upper stage. While you'd like to recover that, it turns out to be pretty complicated. And uh, so most likely that's going to be expendable. And then we have a space vehicle on top, which is the third picture here that you see. Um, our orbital capability is in the design stages right now. And we're not flying that hardware, but we're well into the design of that vehicle. Next slide, please. Now, it turns out that the crux of all space flight is propulsion, especially if you're going to come back and try and land vertically using the same engine that you took off with. Not only do you have to fly your rocket back in through the atmosphere, but you have to then restart your engine, and you have to throttle it because the mass of your vehicle is much lower when you land. So it has to be throttled way down, or you have to have multiple engines that you shut down. That's another way to do it. Um, we are um, very capable at Blue Origin of developing propulsion. We're in our fourth generation of propulsion uh, development. Uh, the engine you see here was developed in... Uh, concert with NASA under CC Dev. It's called the BE-3 for us. 100,000 pound thrust, LOX hydrogen engine, restartable, reusable, and deeply throttleable. Very, very cool technology. We have a really strong propulsion team at Blue Origin. And you see an example of uh, testing at the Stennis Space Center here, as well as a test uh, on our engine stand in Texas. Next slide, please. So if you'll go ahead and run the video, please. I just want to show you an example of some of our flight tests. Um, some of you may have seen this. It's, uh, there's a version of it on our website. Um, what this was was a full-scale, 60-foot-tall rocket 
which uh, launches. This is a suborbit capable rocket. It's not a uh, low altitude demonstrator. But we chose to fly it here on a flight where we launch, and then we detect the problem. And in this case, we intentionally aborted uh, a perfectly good rocket to see if it could come back and land itself on the launch pad. And you'll see it just move out of the video there. And then to get the thrust to weight down, we'll secure one engine. The rocket will come back uh, toward the launch pad. You'll see the landing gear extend just before it touches down. And you can watch it touch down. This, what you're looking at here is very similar to what you would see on a suborbital flight where the rocket returns to Earth, uh, falls to Earth, restarts the engines, and slows itself down to land. We do it a little bit differently than SpaceX, but uh, like them, we believe this type of landing is capable and um, is the right way to go technically. And next PowerPoint chart, please. Next, there we go. So uh, another thing we've done in concert with NASA is we've demonstrated this uh, pusher escape system. You've heard many of the companies talk about using this technology and the advantages of it, primarily that you, it's not an escape tower on top of the rocket that you have to jettison every flight and lose it, but it's something that you can either use the propellant from when you get to orbit, or you can uh, bring it back and, and carry it again. Uh, in the case of our suborbital flight, it tends to be a very good technology. And uh, I'll point out that my little company was the first to actually demonstrate with a flight-like capsule um, a pad escape using a, a pusher escape system. If you run that video, please. Five, four, three. Now imagine you're sitting on the pad waiting for your ride and you have an emergency. It's essentially like ejecting out of a jet, and would that be one heck of a ride? <laughs> We've talked about whether you'd get your money back for that or not. As I mentioned, this is a composite material capsule. Three to six people intended for a suborbital mission. This test and this landing in uh, West Texas, about 100 miles east of El Paso. Many of you probably know where Guadalupe Peak is. We're just south of that. That was our first try, by the way. And you can cut that and move to the next slide, please. All right, I want to uh, finish up with um, just acknowledging that we do have a website. And uh, Jeff Bezos is very good about posting our achievements on that site. You'll see very few predictions about when we're going to fly or the cost of a flight or marketing videos. But you will see evidence of our achievements and accomplishments that are real on this website. We are hiring. For those of you that are interested in jobs in this industry, and um, I want to um, I want to wrap this up by addressing probably what is a, a common question that you all have, and that is, especially if you're going to make investment by the city in spaceports, the question is: Is this real? Uh, can these companies succeed? Um, will they be safe? And I'd like to point to, as evidence, the, my colleagues on the panel here. Uh, these are, are gentlemen, and they're women as well, that uh, in our industry, these are people that I've trusted my life to before, and, uh, and I will do it again. And they are just a small number, a small part of the astronauts that are out in private industry right now helping the companies to succeed. But more importantly, for every one of these gentlemen, there are a couple of hundred former NASA engineers, managers, technicians, working at these small companies, bringing their experience and their uh, talent to these companies to help them succeed. Um, we have many advantages as small companies. Our design architectures, the way we're going to fly, 
have advantages over a shuttle, safety-wise. Um, I'm betting on success. This is um, an example of how we're going to get it. Thank you very much. Great, great word, Bones. Words, Bones. I couldn't, I couldn't have said it better. Um, I want to close here with uh, our last speaker, and this is uh, dovetails nicely with the announcement that uh, Mario made today, and in, in that um, it's, he's going to talk about a company that's developing a vehicle that does horizontal landing, horizontal takeoff, that one day might be suited for a spaceport like uh, Ellington. Um, Rick Searfoss is the next speaker. His call sign is Pops. I think he got that when we were classmates at Test Pilot School together. Um, he's colonel in the Air Force, retired, undergraduate from the Air Force Academy in Aeronautical Engineering, and a master's degree from also from Caltech in Aero. He flew F-111s in the service both, both in the UK and stateside, and as I mentioned, he graduated from the Naval Test Pilot School. Uh, hired by NASA as an astronaut in 1990, he flew twice as a uh, pilot on STS-58 on Columbia and STS-76 on Atlantis, and then he, he commanded STS-90 again back on Columbia, a Neuralab mission. He's had a pretty interesting uh, course after he left NASA in 1998, involving a lot of different activities all related to flying, either jets or rockets, sometimes both, including at NASA's Dryden Research Center at Edwards, and at the Nas National Test Pilot School in Mojave, where he's an instructor. And he's also flown the Easy Rocket and the Rocket Racer. He's now the Director of Flight Test Operations and Chief Test Pilot at x -Corps Aerospace. Thanks, L.A. You know, I had a few uh, nicknames before I showed up at uh, Pax River as the only Air Force guy with all those Navy pilots. And, L.A. and Bones were classmates, and somehow I picked up the nickname Pops. And upon reflection, I think it was because being an Air Force guy, they needed some adult supervision there for all the Navy guys. And that's what happened. Uh, but great experience, uh, great classmates and, and friends here. It's good to reconnect with them. I was perhaps uh, the first former astronaut, or one of the very early ones, to shift over to the Rebel Alliance, you might call it, moving into the commercial space flight world. I was at work one day at Dryden uh, in my test pilot role. I uh, had just discovered that this little rocket company out in Mojave, a few miles to the west, was going to fly a rocket-powered rocket uh, long easy. And I thought, this is really cool stuff. Called them up out of the blue and said, you don't know me, but I used to fly rockets. Can I come see what you do? And uh, they in <coughs> invited me over, took a look at uh, the test firing that day, and I was hooked. So when I decided to move on from NASA, Got affiliated with x -Corp, been working with them for uh, the last 10 years, and it's been, been a great ride. Uh, the company is, uh, so let's go to my next slide. We'll uh, show the people there. Nice small company, uh, classic entrepreneurial start. The four founders maxed out their credit cards back in 1998 and uh, gave it a go. Uh, core competency is liquid uh, propulsion. Uh, we have done uh, over 4,000 uh, firings of some 24 different types of uh, engines through the years. And we've flown our two testbed rocket-powered airplanes uh, about 60 times, and I've flown 49 of those flights. In fact, um, <laughs> if you're into these kind of statistics, uh, x -Corps has flown over a third of the human-carrying rocket flights in the last 10 years of all sources everywhere. Now, if you sum up total impulse on all those, it's a teeny tiny fraction, you know. So uh, I guess you present the statistics to uh, make your point. However, it does make a very compelling case for this thing that's been addressed already multiple times. Reusability, uh, reliability, repeatability, and in our case, we're calling it making it fly like an airplane. We want our operations to be airplane-like as much as possible. And the other uh, kind of watchword is we have is if we can't spill it on our shoe, we don't want to use it. So we're very clear about staying away from toxics like those nasty hypergols, which have their certain technical advantages, but We've chosen not to go there. Uh, numerous projects through the years, although unlike my first three colleagues here, we don't view NASA or the government as a primary customer or even really a significant customer in our business model. We have done uh, work through the years for NASA, uh, AFRL, the Air Force Research Lab, Naval Research Lab, DARPA, so forth, uh, bits and pieces of technology development, including that engine firing in the upper left is uh, 
7,500 pound thrust LOX methane engine back in the days of Constellation that NASA wanted some work done. So we did the development on that and presented the data and so forth. So we're not strangers by any means to doing work for the governments, but um, with the LINX program, our flagship program at the moment, the suborbital piece, we're really not looking to address NASA's needs. Rather, we're looking to address the broader market needs. So um, I'm a guy who likes reality in my pictures. In fact, it was only recently that I even started showing some of our marketing videos and our, our COO, Andrew Nelson, is here and, you know, those guys get out and really love to show that stuff. I'm a nuts and bolts operational guy. If you can't show actual video of something happening, I tend to shy away from it. So I want to start with uh, one of those videos. We'll go to the next one. Hopefully the video will play right away. It's set up to do that. There we go. This was back in 2008 at the big Oshkosh Air Show where we took our um, technology demonstrator, the Rocket Racer, which was developed on a commercial contract and which, by the way, uses the same engine, one engine, and not nearly as developed as the four engines that will be on the Lynx. So this is all part of the de technology development and this process uh, of developing what we need to go fly suborbitally. And for me as a test pilot, it, it was just incredible to be involved in the program right from the start, do all the, the handling qualities, evaluations, envelope expansion with this little rocket plane and the propulsion test, of course. Uh, and then to show it off in front of about 100,000 people. We were actually that day the uh, warm-up act for the F-22 Raptor air show. If, if, it, how many have seen the Raptor fly? And it, it's just unbelievable. You look at it. And it kind of bummed some of the guys out in the company. go, oh, man, we're not nearly as impressive as that. And I go, guys, our whole program costs less than an F-22 canopy. You can be rightfully proud of what you did. <laughs> you know. So just demonstrating, you know, the maneuverability and the... Uh, uh, thrust to weight and the performance of the vehicle there. This, uh, for those of you interested in a few numbers, uh, this was a modified velocity aircraft. The empty weight's about 1,400 pounds, 1,500 uh, pound thrust engine on it. So even with uh, fuel and crew on board, it's darn near a one to one thrust to weight ratio. Great fun doing that. So now I feel okay talking about what's coming because it is getting, uh, in fact, let's go to the next slide. It is getting more real by the day. Flight hardware is on the shop floor out in Mojave, California. And oh, by the way, we have Texas connections as well. We've made a firm commitment to uh, move to Midland once the flight test is substantially complete with the Lynx. Um, obviously, there's, there are tremendous benefits business-wise moving from California to Texas. I, I know I'm preaching to the choir with that. Um, however, from a flight test perspective, uh, to echo what Jim said at Dryden, a few miles west in the Mojave Desert at the uh, Mojave Civilian Flight Test Center is a pretty darn good place to do flight test. Uh, so Lynx is coming together now. This is, uh, of course, an artist's conception. Suborbital vehicle, four 3,000-pound thrust engines, roughly. About the max gross takeoff weight of a T-38, so, you know, don't even think dream chaser size. Think smaller than that. But again, it's for the suborbital mission. Uh, composites extensively throughout as well. In fact, it's virtually all composite, just like uh, Jeff mentioned with uh, Blue, Blue Origins work. So let's uh, take a look at the next slide, and we'll talk about just why do suborbital. You know, in the beginning, it was all about the space tourists, and I personally don't particularly care for that term. I prefer space participant because even for, you know, the people we throw in the right seat and go fly, it will be a little bit more training and so forth required than just being a tourist. Uh, but that is definitely a key element of the market. Interestingly enough, we found through the years that uh, we believe it's going to be a much bigger market seg segment for suborbital research. And then with further development, uh, the Lynx will have the capability to serve as first stage for, as we see in the lower left, for uh, small satellite deployment. We're talking on the orders of 50 kilograms to low Earth orbit. Uh, so horizontal launch, go do your mission deploy in the end game here, deploy a satellite, uh, serve as a first stage for, uh, for um, uh, orbital operations, it becomes an orbital system as well, granted a very small one and nothing to the scale of what we've talked about before. I might also add uh, United Launch Alliance has been mentioned before, the Atlas vehicles. Uh, x -Corps has a significant contract, and I'm not working on it because there's not a stick and you can't fly it, but uh, it's a hydrogen engine development program uh, with United Launch Alliance uh, using our proprietary and X-Core invented piston pump technology. There's a, 
very sweet spot for performance for upper stage engines and for suborbital where you don't need a big, heavy, extremely complex, ex expensive turbo pump. And it's just too much performance to get what we call a blowdown system where you pack the pressure in and that pushes the prop down to the uh, engine. So there's a sweet spot for a different way of doing it. And XCore invented that, have all the patents, all that's locked up and working in a great partnership with ULA. And I think it'd be really sweet someday to see XCore engines on the second stage of taking Dream Chaser and or CST100 and any other customers on up to orbit. So uh, to me, it speaks of, uh, I mean, it would not only be good for XCore's business, but it speaks of incredible synergies uh, that are developing in this industry. And being with it for uh, over 10 years now, it's gone from kind of chuckle, chuckle, ha, commercial space, space tourists into, hey, this is the real deal. And uh, it's very gratifying to come to events like this, uh, meet with my colleagues who are also uh, contributing to it. So enough of that pitch. Let's, oh, payloads inside and outside. That's why there's, I addressed, said three markets, but four pictures on the slide. Uh, let's look at uh, a little more video. And this obviously is artist uh, rendering because we have not entered flight tests yet. But it gives you an idea of the profile. Horizontal uh, launch, about a 1,200 foot uh, takeoff roll, tilted into the vertical, thrust to weight ratio well above one, even right from the start. Of course, get the landing gear up, always nice to do. Uh, about a three minute thrust time, uh, maximum longitudinal acceleration, roughly like a shuttle launch, about uh, three Gs, so three times your normal weight. Uh, we're baseline to wear pressure suits uh, up and back. Uh, it's a front seat sort of experience. Um, you won't be unstrapping and floating around or anything. That's uh, never been in our plan. But on the other hand, great uh, views sitting right up next to the pilot. Enjoy about five minutes of uh, microgravity for the experiments or the view or whatever you want and come back home and land on a runway. So this gives the opportunity to base it uh, many, many locations around the world and as was mentioned er earlier in Mario's talk about uh, there are a number of places in the U.S. already who have spaceport licenses, Mojave being one, of course, with the, uh, which way back in the uh, XPRIZE days. Um, so let's look at the status of Lynx. And again, this is not all that XCOR is doing, but it's, it's uh, primary for us. Uh, so, huh, is the propulsion moving up, Lynn? Go ahead and, there we go, all right. So this just shows one of the propulsion tests uh, of the Lynx engine. And it has been run at full thrust now for full duration. Um, we have not run all four together. That's uh, still in work. Using the uh, flight light thermodynamic cycle of the engine, regenerative cooling, uh, puts out a nice uh, bright yellow flame because the fuel is kerosene, a very pure solvent grade kerosene, liquid oxygen, of course, for the oxidizer. Okay, next slide, please. Aero is going great with the vehicle. Uh, some great Space Act agreements with NASA, also some agreements with the Air Force using subsonic, supersonic wind tunnels. Uh, er, very early on, and this was many years ago, the guys were saying, ah, we can do this all with computational fluid dynamics. And dinosaur that I am said, I don't think so. And uh, we've been very grateful to get that tunnel time and the aerodynamics are tweaked really well. Now this is a Schlieren photograph of, at Mach 3 uh, in one of the, uh, I think this was in one of the Air Force's tunnels. Uh, and on to the next slide, but it's also kind of fun to do some flight operations. So I've been a big RC modeler for many years, and this is a little flying Lynx, uh, and I'll kind of talk over it. There's some talk going on here, and I hesitated to even put this in my presentation. They're just going to laugh at me with my little toy airplane here, right? But I would remind us all that there's a gentleman named John Kiker, some of you may know him, who was head of uh, at JSC Mechanical Systems Division back in shuttle development days. John was a big RC modeler. I did not know him in his days working for NASA. I knew him many years later after he retired because we both flew RC models at the JSC RC Model Club. And John was telling me one day about how they came up with this whole idea of flying the shuttle piggyback on the 747. The initial concept for that came with him and a few of his buddies in the club putting a model together and playing with it and going, hey, this might just work. Pitching it as a proof of concept sort of thing to management who earmarked some money to uh, go study it in more detail and, and that's how we came up with the operation. So working with a, a small, nimble, sometimes cash constrained company like XCOR and putting a project like this together for a few hundred dollars proved useful for proof of concept. We actually even got some interesting engineering data out of it. It's got a 
one ounce, uh, about $200 uh, RC, tele tele it's not telemetry, but it's onboard data logger system to uh, get pedostatic data, three axis accelerometers, uh, and uh, it's a lot of fun too. So, yeah, but it's been very useful in our development and we've, we're so happy with how this little one went, we've invested significantly more to build a quarter scale model that's uh, in work, uh, which will take most of the Reynolds number, those of you that are familiar with that, and aerodynamic coefficients and so forth, take those uh, worries away for the very slow speed aerodynamics of this. You see, this vehicle not only has to be a spacecraft, but before it's ever a spacecraft, it has to be a good flying airplane. And people ask me, aren't you really excited when links will go to space? And I go, yeah, sure, but I'm, I'm a whole lot more worried about first flight and envelope expansion and all the airplane stuff because that's where we, we have to succeed with that before we ever get up to uh, suborbital. Okay, uh, next slide. So this is a layout, kind of a cutout of the structure. Um, most of those parts and pieces are either finished or very close to being finished. Some are on the shop floor. The center fuselage section with the uh, Mark I uh, has uh, aluminum LOX tanks, four of them. That's, uh, well, you saw that on the engine firing. We're using the flight hardware for that test and development. Do you see a common thread here with all of us on test, 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 test? It's uh, very, very crucial to what we do at XCOR as well. Uh, next slide. Just to show you, yes, we do have real hardware. This is uh, carbon fiber. Uh, the, uh, this structure is a pressure vessel, the cockpit. We also have, although I opted not to show it uh, for development purposes, cockpit mock-ups much like uh, have been shown as well. We've been uh, working the human factors and cockpit design over and over, over again with the iterations of that through the years. So all coming together, very exciting stuff, great, great fun for me to be involved with them. And um, like, well, like Jim's company at least, we also appreciate the meat-operated servo, the human being in the loop flying the vehicle. We think there's great value there. And uh, I look forward to continuing to contribute to uh, this particular program. Uh, so that's it. Just last slides, just kind of a closing slide. Thanks. So our mission tonight was to just give a, a brief overview and introduction, if you will, to the commercial spaceflight industry. Um, I, I think you should have some takeaway messages. One is that this is real. It's happening uh, all over the country with people that are very dedicated. Uh, second, that a lot of those people came from not only the astronaut office, but uh, flight controllers, flight directors, managers, technicians, engineers all over NASA. And that body of knowledge is infusing itself and making a pretty strong um, network out there. Uh, third, there's a lot of teamwork going on, not just between the individual companies and the government in, in terms of Space Act agreements and other partnerships, but also between them, as you heard. And uh, fourth, uh, it's about time. I mean, we've been hearing that we're on the cusp of this, and I think uh, this is really, really right around the door, right around the corner from us, and it's an exciting time. So speaking of, um, missions, when I was uh, listening to Pops, I, I had a whisper from Mission Control that we will not have time for questions today, unfortunately. But I'd like to thank our hosts again, um, Space Center Houston and our partners, uh, Houston Airport System, and of course Barrios Technology, who's sponsoring the reception. So thank you very much, and with that, I'll turn it back over to Dr. Alexander. Well, I think Michael said it all, but you can see why we're excited and, uh, and um, why we're excited to have CSF here in Houston for the next few days. So um, uh, we're going to have a reception for uh, invitees only, so you should have your invitation, and this will be on the right in a few minutes. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody for showing, showing up, and I hope you learned a lot. I hope you're as excited as we are, and uh, we'll see Houston um, very much as Space City and continue to be. And again, thank you very much for coming tonight. Thank you.